Hello, we've started a new practice in our lab to do a weekly training, uh, various random topics, some by me, some by others in the lab, and thought we'd post some of these here on, post these on YouTube. So today we're gonna to talk about creating figures for journal articles and conference papers. I'm not gonna go through any uh, logistical details about how to use a particular plotting package, rather just some principles you might think about as you're creating figures uh, to make to make your communication a little more effective, a little clearer, a little more impactful. Let me share my screen. Okay, so first thing I wanna do is I wanna recommend this book uh, that you may not have heard of. It's a title that you probably didn't think to search for when you were looking at uh, figures, but it's called Trees, Maps, and Theorems by Jean-Luc Dumont. And this is an excellent book covering uh, different aspects of writing, presentations, and uh, uh, figures for scientific uh, communication. I just wanna share one example from here and then we're gonna to go to th um, some of our own, but uh, just to, to get you thinking here, let's see, where did I wanna go? Uh, yeah, okay, so here is a graph, right? This is a figure um, and it's a bit cluttered, right? There's a lot of lines all over the place. You know, it's, it's, this is a relatively simple graph, so it's still not hard for you to understand. But I think one of the first principles you wanna think about is to um, be, very intent, uh, be very clear about what is the message that I am trying to convey with this figure, and then try to eliminate anything else that doesn't contribute to that message. Um, so here, you know, there's an excessive use of grid lines. They're probably not helping me at all because I probably don't care about what is maybe that exact number. I'm not trying to pull that off from this figure. Uh, I don't know exactly what the message is here, but in any case, it's pretty cluttered. Um, the use of legend takes up a lot of space. Legends in general, I'm not a big fan of. Sometimes they can be uh, the, the way to go, but often we can use direct labels, which are much clearer. I'll show you a couple examples of that as we go. Um, so how can we do better? Well, here's, here's uh, his next version. Uh, notice many things, right? It's much, much cleaner. Uh, I've kind of gotten rid of all this, what Jean-Luc Dumont calls noise, right? Whereas we're trying to convey this message, anything that's not helping we call noise. Uh, effective use of color, right? And here's a use of direct labels. This is perhaps even more effective because it'll work uh, when, when the data is a little more separated, right? Let's say I've got a curve here and a curve here. That's to me a very obvious case where you should put direct labels because even if you print that in black and white, it's very obvious which is which. In this case, it's probably obvious too because we've got points and, 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 and curves, but we do so much digitally that you should definitely make use of color. Uh, of course, yes, try to make it black and white friendly as you can, but don't be afraid to, to leverage color effectively. So, here, this figure, like things just jump out at me much, much clearer, right? I'm not um, distracted. And again, this was simple, but you, you, if you, once you start thinking about these things and you read papers, you'll see this all over the place. Um, ones where you really have to work to try to figure it out and others where it just comes across much, much clearer. And of course, um, just having great figures alone is not gonna make your papers great, but many great messages, many great works get obscured by figures that are just just really hard. And if you can be um, really clear and really uh, sharp in your figures, it just makes it so much more professional and, and a pleasure to read and just, uh, you know, even subconsciously people will feel like, well, this is just a really great paper when, when, when the communication is clear that way. So other things you might notice, uh, this y-axis has been rotated. Um, sometimes you might not be able to do that, but often a figure is put in a paper, there's a lot of white space around it. And so this is a small thing, but it can help the reader again. We don't have to tilt their head, just anything you can do to, to any obstacles you put in the way of the reader to communicate your message just makes it, you know, less desirable, right? So making things very clear right off the bat uh, where they are, right? So again, contrasting this one from this one. Okay, now the next step uh, has some things that uh, may or may, may be debatable. Again, it depends on what message you're trying to get, but here's another version, perhaps a better version. Uh, here really, again, trying to emphasize the data. You can see that these axes, which uh, are, are a little bit faded, may be less critical. 
Um, instead of pointing out every uh, regular tick mark, maybe all you really are interested in is what is the frequency here at the peak and what is this, uh, what is this called, full width half max or something? What is this uh, uh, frequency width here, right? And so uh, maybe what's this max power? You're really showing those key data points instead of having someone try to figure it out, right? This is not for every every plot. I'm not saying you should go out and, and take every plot and get rid of all the numbers and, and only show a few numbers. Sometimes that's the way to go, but not always, right? Again, you don't have to, uh, I don't necessarily agree with everything in the book and you shouldn't agree with everything I'm saying either. That's not the point to create a, a checklist of these are the things you should do, but rather you should be very intentional. Don't accept the defaults that are just in your plotting package but rather think carefully about what's the message I'm trying to convey and how can I do that most clearly. On that note, uh, whatever plotting package you're using will have some way to set um, defaults. And this is worth doing, going in and figuring out how to do that. Uh, of course, you're going to tweak things for different figures, but often maybe the font choice, the font size, the sequence of colors, the use of lines is probably not uh, what you want or the most desirable. And so some small tweaks there can go a long way so you don't have to do some of those things every time, kind of coming up with a good size for the type of figures you use uh, for your journal papers and, and, and so on. Okay, so that's just one example. Um, let me show you another. This is just, again, just these are just, uh, this is a random example here. This is actually, uh, these slides were made by uh, Judd Mayer, one of the PhD students in my lab. And he just took uh, a figure from another student in the lab who submitted a figure. And this is actually, I think, not a bad figure, but um, he decided, you know, just give me a figure and I'm going to see if I can do anything with it, right? So off the bat, I would say this figure is much cleaner than what we looked at. Um, but are there things that we can think about to, to maybe do this better? So this is showing... Uh, this is just a, a, it's an electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft showing a mission profile. So this is a state of charge of the batteries, uh, one being a full battery, zero being fully dead. Uh, and this is the time of the, the flight, okay? Anyway, not super important, but here's some of the things that uh, Judd was thinking about here. Do I really need these lines here? Maybe that's not a big deal, but again, if I can get rid of things that aren't necessary, let me just think about that. And let me think about these axes. This is, uh, a small touch, but it's something that your readers won't even necessarily notice explicitly, but I've had got comments on that, like, wow, everything just looked really cohesive. And that's here, he's changed the font to match the font of the text in this case. Actually, I don't know. I'm just guessing that it was computer modern. I know it was in LaTeX and that's just the default LaTeX font, but it may have been a different font depending on whatever journal uh, he was using. Very easy to change the font. Um, and again, just a, a small subtle detail, but it just makes things look a little more cohesive that the fonts that are in the plot match the fonts that are in your text. Okay, so first he's just made that change. Then uh, this is an important thing. You wanna be careful how you present the data. So here, this is what we'd call a suppressed zero. Um, and it's actually a little bit misleading here because uh, it makes it look like this is going all the way near to depletion, but that's not the case, right? Zero is actually down here. So we should show that. And if we're not showing zero, right, that doesn't mean every time you should show zero, if my data runs from like 1900 to 2000, of course, if I show zero, I just, I can't see anything, but I got to make that clear. Sometimes I might do that by separating these axes, right? Just, uh, but in any case, you can distort your data significantly, right? And you'll see these in newspapers, for example, they'll show a bar chart where they'll say, oh, um, you know, this thing was... 50% and then here's the next bar and it's like 40%, but the bar is like half the size because you know they just, they didn't go all the way down to zero. So it looks like, oh, wow, this went down by 50% when it was really, you know, 20% or whatever. Okay, so we wanna be careful of that. All right, so what did he do next? Effective use of color. Uh, so he's gonna bring that bar chart in and actually these colors don't quite match what they should, but that's not the point for what we're talking about to get today. Um, rather, he's trying to match these colors to these items that were in, in, in this pie chart here. Um, another thing he's doing here, and uh, I don't necessarily have a problem with pie charts, but sometimes, uh, you know, 
they're, they aren't always clear. In this case, I think it's actually a, a good choice, but say you want to display other things. So he's looking at the other options here. I'm just going to skip down to this one, I think is nice. Again, effective use of color. He's able to add maybe more data here in a compact way, uh, looking at time and capacity. I feel like there's a little bit too much here. Personally, I would simplify this and probably rotate this. But again, it's not to create a list of rules here, but to be, again, intentional about what's the message that you're trying to convey. Um, try to make your figures show that and eliminate things that don't. This has, I think, probably too many messages now, so maybe it should be Maybe this needs to be a table, separate from the figure or whatever, but food for thought. Okay, a few other miscellaneous things you wanna think about with colors. Um, you wanna be aware of, uh, well, there are a lot of good websites to help you choose good color schemes, that aesthetic, but also you wanna think about color blindness. So you can go to these websites, for example, here Judd is taking the color scheme he used and put it through this website and it's showing you what this would look like for um, a few different types of color blindness so you can be sure that you have a, a good color scheme. So again, once you've found a good color scheme, you can put that into your defaults uh, of your plotting package so you don't have to keep uh, you know, entering those in. Uh, and then you can also be very consistent, right? It helps when your figures are consistent throughout. Sometimes you'll see very different styles in different parts of the paper and that can be a little bit jarring. And so if you can make those a little more consistent, Again, a little more cohesive. One more thing about colors is uh, uh, this thing about color bars and plotting packages uh, have gotten much, much better at this. Um, used to be that that Jet was the default for everything. And, um, you know, a lot of people showed that this is not a good color bar. Um, it doesn't, it's not, uh, let me move me out of the way here. It's not what's called perceptually uniform. So, uh, this I'm just showing Matplotlib, everybody's pie plot uh, color bars as an example, but you'll find the same thing in other plotting packages. Um, their defaults now are perceptually uniform. So I think there's an example here, like this is what this kind of means, right? If I'm using this indication of lightness that they vary uniformly, whereas some of these other ones, they kind of vary all over the place. And so you get these contrasts or these uh, areas where it looks like there was a sharp change and there really wasn't, right? It just is an artifact of, of the color choice it has nothing to do with something physical that occurred there. So if you're looking at like, say, a plotting this contour plot, it can really distort the information. Um, besides using perceptual uniform, there are kind of two main classes of color bars. You just wanna make sure you're using the right one for your application. One is these ones that are called sequential that move from you know, one type of color to another uh, in a continuous way, say a dark to a light, for example. And then there's ones that are called diverging, right? Where they've, they've got kind of a central point and they move in both directions. You wanna use this kind of color map if you've got something that's centered, like for example, zero centered. So this is like high and this is low, right? Whereas this is one that is just following along a, a spectrum, right? So it's not, there's not a center point that you're trying to, to highlight. Okay, so that's uh, just a quick, um, Intro there, again, I recommend that book go into further principles, um, but just be thoughtful about your figures. Um, I guess I would add the caution that you can, you can spend endless amounts of time creating really great figures. So you don't wanna fall into that trap either, but even with a relatively small amount of time, a modest effort, you can greatly improve figures from their defaults as you think about messaging send a figure to a colleague and say, hey, does this make sense to you? The other thing I didn't talk about that I really should have is the caption. That's really a key part of the figure. And too often uh, people um, jump to um, a not helpful caption. So for example, in this case, I might say, uh, state of charge as a function of time for the aircraft or whatever. It's, and it's like, well, the caption didn't really tell me anything that wasn't super obvious from what the figure shows, right? Instead, caption can be a time to really highlight that message. In this case, maybe it's like, I don't know, I don't know what the message uh, in this case, but say uh, crews uh, occupied X percent of the time or energy, but only this much of the time or whatever, right? So uh, use it as an opportunity to really drive home that message because as people are flipping through your paper, a lot of times they're going to just jump to these figures and, and those two things together can really go a long ways. 
Okay, that's it for today.